Coming up next, the atmosphere of planet Earth is polluted with evil. Tracking relatively unknown history. And Hubble Bubble, Big Bang in Trouble. It's going to be a good one, folks. It's time for the Walk Television program. Stay there as we study through the work. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembrick. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. You are watching the WAP television program, the weekend edition of the Quick Study television program. Today, we continue finishing up the Tanakh. We do so, Corey and Ryan, by studying the book of Zechariah, or Zephaniah, excuse Zephaniah. me, Zephaniah. Yes. <laughs> now, today on Zephaniah, our reading is Zephaniah 1 to 3. But we're actually going to be looking at, a little bit later on, the atmosphere of this planet polluted with evil. Now, a lot of people are worried about global climate change and so on, and I understand that, but there's something else globally in the spiritual atmosphere that is happening, and we're gonna be talking about that and God bringing a conclusion to that as we grow closer and closer to the end of time. Bible Archaeology, what's up a little bit later? Well, we are gonna be taking a look at the history that happens in between the finishing of the Old Testament of the Bible and the beginning of the New Testament. So it, it starts uh, at the end and ends at the beginning. All right, that's going to be kind of interesting. Okay, yeah. then we have uh, Cosmic Mysteries. What's yes. up? Yes. Well, the Big Bang Theory, though revered by many, actually has a lot of problems. Due to time constraints, we're going to be looking at just one of these problems. All right, we also have the question, which we're going to deal with a little bit later on. The question is this, why do you believe in the Bible's literal creation story when science has already proven it otherwise wrong? And we have a challenge for you coming up later. Stay there. The well-respected and revered King James Bible was the very first English Bible in which the efforts of 54 accomplished scholars were joined together to bring formal equivalence word-for-word -word translation from the Hebrew and Greek text. It took six years and six teams of scholars to carefully pour over the text to assure fidelity of translation. Interestingly, the official title of this Bible is not the King James Bible, but the authorized version. King James never gave his official royal approval for this work, probably for political reasons. Get your quick study pocket guide, go through the Bible with us, write P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. We are viewer supported, and if you'd be kind enough to pray about what God would have you do, remember we are supported by gifts from people just like you. Again, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Today in the Quick Study Pocket Guides, if you're following along with our print companion to this show, The Walk, and also Quick Study, uh, our, our reading covers the books of Zephaniah and Haggai. Now, these books are separated by uh, some time. The book of Zephaniah happens during the time period of Assyrian dominance in the Middle East, whereas the book of Haggai actually occurs after the exiled Israelites have returned to Judah and Jerusalem during the reign of Cyrus, uh, Cyrus the Great king of Persia and now it's the reign of Darius and they're going to begin to rebuild the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. Now this really this this whole episode starts off what we call the intertestamental period that is the time between the finishing of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. So right now you and I are going to track some of this history. The prophet Malachi the final Old Testament prophet, 
lived during the time of Persian dominance. Israel enjoyed a kind of social and religious freedom. Their second temple in Jerusalem had been built. They were no longer exiles. But Persia was not to stand forever. Macedonian Prince Alexander the Great led the armies of Greece to victory over the Middle East, overthrowing the massive Persian Empire, and with it, Judah and Jerusalem. After Alexander's death, his kingdom is split between his generals. Judah switches hands and ends up being ruled by the Seleucids. Antiochus IV, Judah's Seleucid king, tries to bring about a new unity, a new Greek oneness in his lands. Unfortunately, he does this by banning all native religious practice, forcefully instituting Greek practices, even going so far as to build an altar to Zeus in the temple of God in Jerusalem. This enrages a Jewish family, the Maccabees. The revolt that follows frees the temple and the Jews themselves for a short time. Today we study the busy prophet Zephaniah in the midst of all the busyness of Judah. People coming, people going. Zephaniah mentions in his background that he is from Cush, or one of his fathers is Cush, meaning he is probably from North Africa as well. Now this is interesting. He serves between 640 and about 612 BC, broadcasting God's message to the people of Judah to return like many prophets do. Zephaniah 315 also mentioned this, that God actually sings over his people. Fascinating. The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place the names of the idolatrous priests with the pagan priests, those who worship the host of heaven on the housetops, those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord, but who also swear by Milcom, those who have turned back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. Be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice, he has invited his guests. And it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children, and all such as are clothed with foreign apparel. In the same day, I will punish all those who leap over the threshold, who fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. And there shall be on that day, says the Lord, the sound of a mournful cry from the fish gate, a wailing from the second quarter, and a loud crashing from the hills. Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. You know, Zephaniah is one of God's prophets who can see across time and the universe better than any of our recent technological breakthroughs. It is, in fact, an amazing thing to know that God reveals through the technology of the Holy Spirit the future to men. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to Zephaniah right now. He's telling him not just about the judgment of God, but also about the character of God. Now, I find that absolutely stunning and amazing as we focus on these particular passages. One of the things we learn through the prophets, beloved, we must remember, 
is we learn the passion of God through the prophets. Now, it's true that through doctrines of the Bible, you know, we learn about the kingdom of God and, and we learn all about that. But one of the things we have to remember is that when we focus on the prophets, we learn about God's passion and his reaction to when Satan tries to destroy us. And we can learn about who God is from that. Very interesting. Well, today as we explore Zephaniah, we have to ask three questions, and that is this. What is happening in the story? Very good question. The second question we ask ourselves is, to whom is it happening? Well, this is happening to Zephaniah, and he's prophesying to ancient Judah. And then the third thing we ask ourselves is, well, why did the Holy Spirit put it here? Well, the reason the Holy Spirit puts things in the Bible is not to waste our time and, and not to try to entertain us. But the Holy Spirit puts things in the Bible, albeit sometimes it's an entertaining way. The Holy Spirit puts things in the Bible to let us know the secrets to the kingdom of God, uh, the keys, if you would, to the kingdom of God. And so with that in mind, let's focus a little bit on what Zephaniah says in chapter 1. Let's introduce the great prophet. Here he is. The Word of God says, The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah. In the days of Josiah, the son of Amnon, Josiah was the great revivalist, by the way, Zephaniah 1, 1 and 2. He was the king of Judah. Now here is the second verse. I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. That leads us to our very first truth to live by when framing our mind in the worldview according to the Bible and God. Here it is. What the, uh, what the world is now, what we're looking at now, what we're looking at and developing our careers for now is temporary. It will not last. God is redeeming heaven and earth. Now this idea that what we see now is not what we're going to get in the future is so alien and so unusual uh, to the average mindset. We are so focused on our best life now, our needs now. We are so focused on uh, achieving what we can now, uh, trying to obtain our full potential now, uh, forgetting that what we need to do is focus on God's best will now, God's best purpose for us now. Uh, God's best design for us now because that's the only thing that will matter that we can take to heaven with us. What we can take to heaven with us is what? We can take to heaven uh, God's faithfulness and our faithfulness to Him. We can take to heaven that we've read His Word. Very, very important. And that Word changes us. Let's go back to the Scripture in verse 3. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 3 says, the great prophet, he says about God, God speaks to him and says, I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens and the fish in the sea and the stumbling blocks along the wicked. Uh, I, I will, uh, I will uh, cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. Which really brings us to truth to live by number two. God's promises, and he promises this in the future, he promises to remake heaven and earth for the redeemed of the Lord. Now this is exciting. God says what you see now is not how it's going to be in the future. There will come a time, beloved, according to the great prophet Zephaniah, that we will be able to serve God and serve the Lord without the trappings of our sinful nature. Now, won't that be different? When we will be able to have friendships and, and uh, speak with one another without the trappings and the bondage of the gravity of our sinful nature. And that's the new body. That's the new heaven and the new earth. That's why Jesus says in Revelation, every tear is going to be dried up. There's no more oceans there, meaning there's no more separation. But we must move on to these last few verses in Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Here they are. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place. And the names of the idolatrous priest, which the pagan priest, those who worship the host of heaven on the housetops, those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord, but also swear oaths by Milcom. Now this is interesting. The practices of demonics and Satan's social uh, and spiritual structures load the earth down with destruction 
it will not always be that way. And aren't you glad? Because we are not going to be able to reach uh, that place where God originally planned us to be with all of these trappings. So Colossians 5 reminds us, beloved, if we are believers in Jesus Christ, to put our mind and set our mind on the future, on things above, not be trapped on the things in this earth. to continue down this historical road that we started traveling on earlier in the program. We're talking about the time period, uh, the, the history that happens in between the end of the Old Testament of the Bible and the beginning of the New Testament, because when we finish off the Old Testament, the Israelites have returned uh, to Judah and Jerusalem, and they've rebuilt the temple of the Lord. And there's tons of history that happens. And then right away in the book of Matthew in the New Testament, we start out where Rome is the dominant force in the world in the ancient Middle East uh, and that sets up the time of the Messiah of Jesus Christ. So right now I want to track with you the rise of the Empire of Rome. We don't have a lot of time so it's going to be brief. I would encourage you to do some of your own study as well. The Greek conquered territory was nowhere near as strong as it had been under the brute force and speed of Alexander the Great and another world power was rising out of its own internal conflicts to take advantage, Rome. Rome had already pushed north. It had defeated the great trade city of Carthage and taken control of the Western Mediterranean. So it turned its attentions east to Greece and the Middle East beyond. Under Roman ruler and general Pompey, Rome sweeps through city after city, taking the Greek empire, subduing Judah, and setting up subject kings in each territory to rule the people with loyalty to Rome. Soon, Judah was introduced to its new, soon to be famous ruler, Herod the Great. Herod first was a military governor in Galilee before being raised to the status of King of Judea. Herod was violent and controversial, ruling from 37 to 4 BC. He embarked on building projects all over his territory, including the famous upgrades to the Jerusalem temple. Herod indeed had begun to set the stage for the coming Messiah. Every day, in many ways, you are being lied to. Quick Study Television and Bible Discovery TV present this amazing documentary movie called The 12 Biggest Lies, featuring people like Dr. Ravi Zacharias, Kirby Anderson, Calvin Smith, Richard Fangard, Creation Ministries International, Dr. Chuck Misler, Ray Comfort, and many more. Hosted by Kevin Sorbo, this 12 Biggest Lies movie answers many questions that people wonder about the Bible and about the world and society around us. Who am I? Where did I come from? What's the meaning to life? What happens after I die? Even the most radical biblical scholars and historians I believe that Jesus certainly exists. The most powerful weapon in the world is the truth. What I believe to be true is going to alter my everyday life. For your copy of The 12 Biggest Lies, send $20 or more to Quick Study Television, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W 5G2. In the United States, P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. Amazing truth. Ancient scribes record amazing truth. 
Flags from different cultures around the world all have the same emblems. The flag of the country of Wales is a dragon. In China and Japan, dragons are revered as their pictures are found throughout both cultures. The many references to dragons in the Bible, as well as early recorded traditions of most nations in antiquity, certainly can't be shrugged off as mere fairy tales. Most probably represent real history of dragons or dinosaurs encountering man before they became extinct. This is consistent with the Genesis record. Currently in our time in history, the Big Bang Theory is taught as absolute fact. Taught as fact, yet the number of problems it faces are staggering. Today we're going to look at just one of these many problems. It is known as the Baryon Number Problem. The Big Bang Theory is the naturalistic attempt to explain the origin of the universe. In this scenario, the entire universe starts out as an infinitely small and infinitely hot point, called a singularity. This point then expands rapidly and the energy cools down as it is dispersed. This energy then becomes matter in the form of hydrogen and helium. It is then from these gases that everything comes together and condenses into stars and galaxies. This is the most commonly accepted theory of our origin in our day and age, and yet nearly every step is riddled with problems. In fact, the number of problems with this model are so great that they could not nearly all be covered here. We will therefore just look at one of the problems involving the conversion of energy to matter. It is called the Baryon Number Problem. This is the issue of missing antimatter. To state it simply, if the Big Bang were true, then it should have created antimatter. Antimatter is a substance like ordinary matter, only with the charge of the particles reversed. Ordinary matter has a proton which is positively charged, and has an electron which is negatively charged. Antimatter has an antiproton which is negatively charged, and an anti-electron, also called a positron, which is positively charged. It is also important to note here that a proton is also called a baryon. The baryon number problem is not an issue of whether or not energy can be changed into matter. After all, energy can be converted into matter in a laboratory. But the issue is that when these changes occur, they always produce an equal amount of antimatter. As far as we know, matter cannot be created from energy without creating an exactly equal amount of antimatter. To sum it all up, if the Big Bang actually did happen, then it would have also produced equal amounts of antimatter. However, the universe contains virtually none. With the estimated number of atoms in the universe being a 1 followed by 80 zeros, this is no small imbalance. Big Bang believers realize just how big of a problem this is and have been forced to come up with an idea to try and save this naturalistic scenario. They've proposed that on rare occasions, energy can produce matter without any antimatter. This, of course, is based on speculation and has never once been observed. Secular physicists continue to speculate to try and solve this problem, even though observational science has shown us that when matter is created, there is always an equal amount of antimatter. While a lack of antibaryons plagues the Big Bang model, it is actually a very important design feature for biblical creation. This is because when baryons and antibaryons touch, they actually destroy each other and release large amounts of dangerous radiation. The fact that matter exists without an equal amount of antimatter is a testimony to the supernatural design of the universe and goes in accordance with the Bible. Isaiah 45.18 says, God formed the earth to be inhabited. Now, one of the things we learned, Ryan, is on this particular segment is that there's a lot of assumptions that are made in science, and it's not rock-solid proven anything, but it's taught that way in the schools. Absolutely, yeah. Very interesting, which brings us to our question of the week, which we had to defer last week to this week. Yeah, and here it is. Time. Uh, the question is this. It says, why do you believe in the biblicals, uh, the Bible's literal view of creation, the six days, 24-hour day story, when science has proven you wrong. Hmm. So what do you think, Ryan? Well, actually, this is a very common belief today that the secular media has pushed. Because of the great successes of observational science, many people, unfortunately, buy into the ideas that origin science has the same authority. See, there's actually two types of scientific procedure. There's observational science and historical or origin science. Observational science is built on principles we can test and use. 
This kind of science put men on the moon and gave us electronics and stuff like that. But historical or origin science is about working out things that happened in the past. And since we can't test or experiment on past events, historical science is very limited. Some of the greatest historical scientists said it best. I want to actually put it on the screen. They said, the conflicts between science and religion occur in historical science, not in operational science. Unfortunately, the respect earned by the successes of operational science confounds many into thinking that the conjectural claims arising from origin science carry the same authority. Remember, scientific data alone can't prove creation or evolution. No scientist was there in the past to view it, to view the events, so he must make assumptions. Hmm. These assumptions will be based on whatever his worldview is. It's not a battle of the data, it's a battle of the different worldviews. And that is really important. Mm. And we, we just came from uh, recently, in the month of August, from a, uh, an event, a creation, super creation event, in which we saw well-trained, highly educated, developed scientific mm -hmm. minds in the marketplace of academia who solidly believe in a six-day creation and explain why scientifically mm -hmm. one of the most, and you can, you can see that at uh, our website, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Click on the bottom where it says mm -hmm. School of Creation, yeah. and you'll see those scientists, one of them, Dr. Mel Silvestri. Mm -hmm. But also, there's another web page you can go to for more information, which is what? Creation.com. Mm -hmm. And that is where actually that, that quote came from a book that you can get on creation.com. I believe it's the answers book. It is the answers book. And so, you know, Ryan and Corey, a lot of people uh, think that, you know, because I know with the recent governor going into the presidential race, race in the United States, they were mocking him and make fun of, fun of him because he believes in a fairy tale. And yet uh, the truth is that because he believes in creation, yet the truth is that, that the idea of monkeys turning into humans and fish and amoeba slime turning into man a bit more of a stretch than mm. a creator making two human beings at least it is yeah, for me I, it is for me as well and science tells that story at creation.com that's creation.com our friends at cmi want to encourage you to investigate it for yourself we'll see you next time on the walk you know you try to be faithful to the bible to the prophets that you speak about and talk about as we go through the Bible and what we learn from Zephaniah today is we learn that God delights in his people. He actually sings over them. Can you imagine? What does that sound like? This, of course, Zephaniah chapter 3. Well, you can hear it if you accept Jesus Christ into your own life. God has so much love that he wants to give you but he will not force it upon you. You must respond to him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So I invite you today by letting you know that God is for you when you put God before you. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. I want to know that love of the heavenly father. I believe you died on the cross and rose again and today I give you my life.